Good morning. Uh, I just want to say I'm honored to be able to do this this morning. Uh, Pastor Allen, I think, called me Wednesday, and uh, he had to call in the third string, but um, I'm here. Uh, I had a few things on my heart this morning that uh, I wanted to say, and uh, we're not here by accident today. You're not here by accident. And uh, Matthew 18, 20 says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Now, I know if, if all of y'all are like me, y'all got needs. You know, I'm not saying ask God for to hit the lottery or anything like that, or money, or a new house, or a boat, but... If you really have a need, God, if you pray to God for that need, he will answer that. He will answer that prayer. So keep that in mind. And uh, Psalms 98, 4 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into your joyous song and sing praises. So let's, uh, let's open up our hearts to the Lord, I know the Holy Spirit's in this place, no doubt about it. Uh, he's in this church today, and he's listening to you. So we're going to praise him with these songs. At first, we're going to uh, start with song uh, 138, hymn 138 at Calvary. And we're going to sing all four verses. say God is great and all the time amen all right our next song is uh, 484 higher ground I'm pressing on the upward way you hide Every day, still praying as I onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lift me up and let me stand. My faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane than I. 
Thank y'all. And amen. All God's people said, amen. Brother Chris, this yours? Let me give him his Bible. <laughs> there you go. Is that yours? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Got to have the Bible. <laughs> amen. Thank you again, church, for singing out today. And y'all did a great job. Chris did a great job. I, I appreciate him stepping up because I can promise you. You don't want me to lead you singing, I can promise you. You would say, oh, my Lord, he needs to stick to preaching because he sure can't sing. Now, I love singing. I love to hear it. I, I listen to Christian music all the time. It blesses my soul, and it keeps me encouraged and helps keep my mind thinking clearly. In fact, this morning when I got in my car and turned on Enlightened, Gerald Wolf and Greater Vision were singing the hymns that we were singing here today. I said, man, that just can't be by accident. That was the divine design. So... Thank you again, Ms. Wanda, Brother Martin, and for each of you singing out those precious hymns. So I invite you now to take your Bible and go with me to the last book in your Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 2, as we continue our series that I'm calling What's in Store for the Future, taking a fresh look at the book of Revelation in light of what's going on in our world today. And this morning I'm preaching on this subject, a watered-down faith. And so let's read our text, Revelation 2, starting in verse 18. And we'll follow the reading of God's holy, inspired, inerrant, infallible word with prayer. The Bible says, And to the angel, that's the pastor or the messenger, of the church in Thyatira, write, These things, says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality, and each thing sacrifice to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent. Of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now, say, now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. But hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like potter's vessels, as I also receive from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let us pray. God, our Father in heaven, ask again, Lord, for that fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. Lord, to empower me. 
Lord, to preach your word of truth as a dying man to dying people. Lord, I must decrease, you increase, oh God. And I pray that you'll bind the devil. Lord, I pray that you'll minimize any type of distraction that may cause us to lose our focus. Lord, we want to keep our eyes on you, Lord. Keep our mind on your word. And I pray that each of us will be just transformed by your truth that never returns void and really sets us free. I confess the devil, our enemy, is a defeated foe. And you, Lord Jesus, are Lord of all. So you just have your will in this service in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Revelation was addressed to seven specific churches that actually existed in the Asia Minor when John was inspired by God on the Isle of Patmos to write this book. These seven churches had their own physical address. They each had their own pastor. And the pastors of these churches received the message of the Revelation and were instructed to preach and teach the message to their church and the church members were instructed to hear it, read it, receive it, and obey it. So each of these seven churches actually did exist during the first century time. But prophetic Bible scholars also believe these seven churches also show us the seven types of churches that not only existed then, but still exist throughout the church age. They also uh, represent seven eras of history. Seven eras of specific times from the time of the apostles all the way to the end of the church age, which is still yet to happen. That's when the rapture of the church will take place. And it is believed that the church at Thyatira represents the medieval time, the dark ages leading up to the 16th century. During that time, true believers uh, suffered bitter persecution under the hands of institutionalized religion. But also keep in mind that this is still a word for our church today. This is speaking to each of us as believers. So we really need to listen to what God has to say to us today. May God help us hear what the Spirit is saying to each of us through this very important message that the Lord gave to the church at Thyatira. Now just as every story has a beginning, every church has a start. So we say, well, how did Thyatira really get its start? Well, what's interesting is when you read your New Testament in the book of Acts chapter 16, you'll come across a story where there were some ladies down by the riverside. They were worshiping God near Philippi. And the Apostle Paul came to that place of prayer and worship and began to share his faith. And there was a woman there named Lydia. The Bible says she was a seller of purple. She actually came from the city of Thyatira. And so as she listened to Paul preach the gospel, something beautiful happened. The Bible says God opened her heart. Suddenly, the light bulb came on. It all began to make sense how a person can know God through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And Lydia received the Lord Jesus as her Savior. She wanted to follow the Lord in obedience to be baptized. But she also wanted Paul to come share that message of the gospel with her family. So here was a woman converted, changed by the power of God, who had a desire in her heart to reach her family. And so just maybe she was the one that God used to light the fire in Thyatira so a church could begin. Because when she went back to her city, she began to tell people what happened to her down by the riverside. Suddenly more, and pe more people started uh, getting saved and then baptized. And then a group of people would gather together and they got themselves a pastor. And, and that's how God forms a church. God always starts a church as people get saved, baptized, and then added to the church. Well, when Jesus addressed this church body, he had some things that he was not happy with, some of the members that was going on. He gave them some words of condemnation and warning. There were people who were falling away from the face. And that really shouldn't shock us, because that should be expected the closer we get to the second coming of Jesus. Paul told uh, young pastor Timothy that in the latter times or the latter days, there's going to be a falling away of the faith. And we're definitely seeing that in which we live. Now, I've already explained to you before in a previous sermon series that the latter days or the last days is that time between the first coming of Jesus that's already fulfilled and the second coming of Jesus, which is yet to be fulfilled. And so everything in between is the latter days. That means we're living in the last days. And the Bible is clear, in the last days, some people will depart from the faith. One gospel writer writes that when the Son of Man comes again, we'll even find faith upon the earth. 
As we see church attendance declining nationwide and more and more people deciding that church life is no longer important, it makes you wonder if, if all this is happening right before our very eyes, it shows you how close Jesus is coming. So it's, distur it's disturbing when you see someone confess their faith in the Lord, they get baptized, they get plugged into a local church for a season, they get themselves a Bible, they may even get plugged into a small group like a Sunday school class or a Bible study group, and they seem for a little while to be living the life of a disciple. But then something happens in their life and they begin to drift. And the next thing you know, they're gone. You just don't see them at church again. And over my years, I've seen people who've actually confessed Christ with their mouth, but later begin to even deny that there's a Christ. They deny that there's a God. They deny that there's a heaven and there's a hell. They completely deny the gospel that they once said they believe in. So how do you explain people falling away from the faith like that? Well, I believe the scriptures explain it for us. And I want to give you some reasons today why people fall away from the faith. And this isn't my opinion. This is right from the Word of God. First of all, people will fall away from the faith because they forget. They forget what's important. They forget what's important. We have all these distractions in the world today and all these voices speaking to us. Plus, we have a real devil going to and fro on this earth, seeking whom he may devour. And there are some people, they let their guard down and they just lose sight of what's really important and what should be a priority in life. And let me tell you, if you're not careful, my friends, it can happen to any of us. You can begin to drift away from God by forgetting what's really important. That's why we as believers must never forget this. We must always remember what's important in the eyes of God. But sadly, some people forget that. They forget what's priority. And in some cases, some people forget about Jesus Christ. They actually forget about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is supposed to be first and foremost in your life, not just on Sunday, but every single day of the week. So notice what the Bible says. These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Every time you see Jesus mentioned in the book of Revelation, notice, He's not mentioned as that lowly Jesus being born in a manger. He's seen as that fiery, sovereign ruler who's coming back to this earth to take charge and to render judgment. The Bible says the Son of God. That's the title that speaks of his uh, position in the Godhead. Jesus is the second person in the divine Holy Trinity. That means he's not just a man. He's not just a martyr. He didn't have a beginning. He is the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is God. There is no end to Jesus. He's the second person of the divine Godhead. And since he's Emmanuel, which means God with us, that means he must have first place in our life. He must have the supremacy in our life. No one or nothing should be above the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. The Jesus Christ is where our affection and our, our attention should all be channeled. So the Bible speaks of the fact that he sees all things. That's what it really means when it says his eyes are like a flaming fire. The Lord Jesus can see all things. He can see right through a person's heart. He has spiritual divine x-ray vision. Nothing is hidden from Jesus. So you have to ask yourself a question today. Can I honestly say without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is not just my Savior, but Jesus Christ is my Lord. He's my King. He's my source. He's my sufficiency. He is my object of worship. Because let me tell you in love, you will become what you worship. When you worship the things of this world, when they become more important to you than God, you'll become more like the things of the world. But when you worship the Lord Jesus Christ first and foremost, worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ just motivates a believer to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important. Now, don't forget Jesus Christ is to be first and foremost in your life. We must never forget that. But there's something else that people often forget that we must not, we must not forget. And that's working. Working for God. Working for God is very important. Jesus said something. He says, I know your works. So let me just give you a word of encouragement for anybody who works for the Lord. Because I know there are people here, and you do your best to use your gifts for the Lord. There's people here that are gifted to sing. They're, they're gifted to play instruments. There's some that serve as teachers. Some that serve as a usher, greeter. Some of these have a visitation ministry, a nursing home ministry, a card ministry, a phone call ministry. Um, there's some of you that just have a prayer ministry, which is a very powerful ministry in any church. 
Some of you do things behind the scenes. There's administration ministries. There's building maintenance, benevolence ministries. A lot of things goes in and outside the walls of the church that you can be involved in. But if you're not careful, you can also become disheartened. You can become um, discouraged when you don't see visible results that you want to see. And you might even get to wonder sometime, if, is what I'm doing really making a difference? But notice what Jesus said to this church. He says, I know your works. Now, I want you to understand something this morning. Even though you may never get a pat on the back, you may never get a plaque, you may never get any earthly recognition or never get a trophy. I want you to know God sees everything you do. That means every act of kindness you ever offered someone in the name of Jesus. Everything you do for Jesus on the front lines or behind the scenes, God himself sees it and he will personally reward you in heaven for being faithful to do what you do for him through his church. But let's not be confused this morning because we're not saved by works. We work for God because we are saved. Big difference. The Bible says we're we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. That means if grace is something that I earn through good works, then it wouldn't be a gift. It would be payment for services rendered, then it would cease to be grace. And my friends, there's no way humanly possible I could ever have a right standing before a holy God based on my works. The best I could ever do in my flesh and my own heart, which is fallen and has a sin nature, which that means it's already tarnished, even though what I may think is good and righteous, it's all like filthy rags in the sight of a holy God. My only hope to be saved is to go to the cross where redemption was accomplished through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when I go to the Lord Jesus Christ and I put my faith on what He did for me, His work, His full payment for my sin, that's when I receive salvation and the gift of eternal life. And so if you really have received that gift of salvation by grace, then there's going to be some evidence that really bears fruit. That means you're going to work. Faith that saves you produces good works. Faith without works is dead. It's what the Bible says. And so if you're really saved, you're going to want to work for the Lord. When you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, with the service that you do for the Lord inside and outside the walls of the church is just simply an expression of the life of Jesus that's now living inside your heart. And so working for the Lord, not wasting your life, not spending your life, but investing your life in the things of God is very important that we should never forget. But a lot of people forget about the importance of working for God. But let me tell you another thing that people forget that's so important. It's right here in the Word of God, and that's love. Loving people. Loving people. Now, we're clearly taught in the Word of God to love God first and foremost, because when we do that, then we're going to love other people. People should be loved. They should be cherished and never taken for granted. Notice the Bible puts two words together here, love and serve. You see that in verse 19? Love and service go hand in hand. Now, a person can serve without love, but that's not good. Because usually a person who serves without love, that's the person who may do things, but they complain the whole time they're doing it. That no, no one gets the, the, God don't get the glory for that. But you can't love without serving. Love and service goes hand in hand. And so when you find the word love in a passage like this, this is referring to agape love. This is the love of God, the highest expression of love there is. That's the love we see in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. This is the love, according to Romans chapter 5, that is shed abroad in our heart the moment that we get saved. That means this love doesn't come to us naturally. It is a supernatural love that comes from God, given to us as a gift. This is the kind of love that a man is supposed to have for his wife. The Bible says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loves the church. That means this is an unconditional love. It's a sacrificial love. It's a love that's not of this world. It is a love that is unique to the born-again believer. All because for the love of God for us and in us the moment we get saved. And so when you really have this kind of love in you, then you're not going to be self-focused. You're not going to be self-centered. You're going to be Christ-centered. The Bible teaches us to walk in love. We should be controlled by love. Jesus told us the greatest commandment is to love God. And the second one is to love others. But it's not love if you're not giving it away and you're not sharing it. It's not love if it don't involve sacrifice and receiving people without conditions. 
I mean, this is the type of love that really brings unity and harmony in the body of Christ if God's people would just practice the love of Jesus in their life. Because that's when we really do accept each other without conditions. In other words, you don't have to meet my expectations to be what I want you to be. I love you in spite of that. I'm so thankful that God loves me in spite of me. God knew what he was getting when he got me, but he still loves me. I thank God for that. And that kind of love revolutionizes a church when people come into an atmosphere and just sense the love of God among God's people. When the love of God is present, there's no judgmental attitude. There's no special cliques. There's just a sweet, sweet spirit of love among the church body. And thank God we have that. We should never take that for granted. The Bible's clear. The motive for every believer serving, singing, preaching, teaching, witnessing, exercising the spiritual gifts that God has given you, the main motive is love. Love for God, love for one another. Because if it's not love, then it profits you nothing in the eyes of God. Years ago, there was a great preacher who's now with the Lord. This is what he said about love as it relates to the church. He says, love is the one thing that if a church has, regardless of the size of the church, regardless of its location, if a church has love, it really doesn't mean it need anything else. But if it doesn't have love, then whatever else it has doesn't really mean much. The motive behind any work we do for God and God's people is loving God and loving one another. But sadly, many people forget that. And when you don't love others like you should, that's because you're not loving God like you should. And when that happens, your church life then will no longer be important to you and you will drift away. That is a fact. But it's a fourth thing that's very important that a lot of people forget, but we shouldn't. And that's being steadfast. Being steadfast. Notice the word faith there in verse 19 and the word patience. Those two words go together. Patience means perseverance. The word faith here is a specific word that speaks of patient, persevering, continuing faith. I mean, you stick with it. You're in it for the long haul. This talks about being constant. This talks about being consistent, just being steady. The Apostle Paul would say to a young pastor Timothy as he sat in a jail cell, writing to his letter as he was fixing to die, knowing his time on earth was coming to an end, he says, I'm telling you, even as I faced the executioner, Timothy, I fought a good fight, and I'm finishing the race, but I have kept the faith. In other words, I am steady, I have continued, I have endured to the end. And I want you to understand about being a Christian, it's not about just starting a race, it is actually finishing the race. And I've known a lot of people over the years who've started a race, and then they stumble, they backslide, and then all of a sudden they quit. They quit the race. Listen, there's a lot of traps out there the devil uses to try to cause people to be discouraged, ashamed. Sometimes just give up. That's why we all have to always be cautious and keep our guard up every single day. This is a very important priority in the life of a Christian to be steadfast, to continue in the faith, to be committed to be faithful to the Lord in the good times and the bad times. We should always want to be steady in the faith. Quitting should never be an option for a committed Christian. Being steadfast really helps us stay alert and be watchful of those sin traps because Satan loves to set landmines out there to knock us down, to cause us to stumble, or just to blow our witness as a Christian. Keep in mind, many times Satan's sin traps and landmines are camouflaged, and they're disguised in order to appeal to the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, as well as the pride of life. That's why every single one of us as Christians and ministers for Jesus Christ, we have to be careful. We have to keep our guard up every single day in our daily walk with Jesus. Because it's not over until it's over, until we cross the finish line. And if we don't keep our guard up, and we don't stay steadfast in the faith, then somewhere along the line in life, you can easily get entangled with sin. It could ruin your reputation. It could ruin your Christian witness. It could hurt the church. But most of all, it brings dishonor to the glory of our Lord. So we have to be steadfast and to be cautious and careful so that we don't make any place for the devil. We don't make provisions for our flesh to stumble. We can't make place for evil. We can't make place for sin. We have to be constantly vigilant, cautiously um, focused in our walk with the Lord. We have to remain that way. We've got to keep our focus and be steadfast on that high prize and the, the calling that we have in God in Christ Jesus. 
I personally have a goal. I want to be like Paul. I want to be able to say with integrity that I truly have fought the good fight, that I've finished the race and I've kept the faith. I really want to be able to finish the, cross the line whenever that time may be. I want to be able to fall into the arms of Jesus, look full into His wonderful faith and hear the sweet lips of glory say, Welcome, well done, my good and faithful servant. Every born-again Christian should have that goal. Be steadfast. And keeping the goal. Keep your eyes on the prize of that upward call of God in Christ Jesus. But I say there's a lot of people that fall away from the faith because they forget what's important. They forget about Jesus Christ being first and foremost. They forget about the importance of working for God in and through the church because they forget about their love for God. And when you forget about that, you won't love other people like you should. Some people forget about being steadfast in the commitment and being faithful to God at all costs from beginning to end, good times, bad times. But then some people depart from the faith because they just simply forget about the importance of growing, growing in the Lord. That's something that really should never end to the moment we get to heaven. I mean, from the time you're saved, you should be a growing Christian until Jesus takes you home. Notice what Jesus said in verse 19, right near the end of it. He said, as, as far as for your works are concerned, the last are more than the first. In other words, there was a group of Christians here that were growing. They were continuing to bear fruit. You see, true discipleship involves growing, but that takes discipline on a part. That don't come easy. I wish there was a one key I could give you to make you instantly mature as a believer, but there's not just one key that makes that happen. God didn't give us just one key. He actually gave us a key ring. It's got 66 keys, known as the 66 books of the Bible. There's always something to learn fresh from the Word of God. You will never exhaust the Word of God. I've been studying the Bible ever since I was a child, and I'm still learning something every day. Even passages I have seen many times, there's always just something just to grab you every time you reach, read and study the Word of God. A Christian disciple is never arriving. We're always works in progress. We're ever becoming and never arriving. That's why the Bible says we'd go out and we'd preach the gospel and teach them to deserve all things. Well, that's an ongoing process. People get won to Christ. They get baptized. It don't end there. The Bible says teach them to observe all things. That's the process of discipleship. That's part of our sanctification, our growing in the Lord. And the Bible is clear that the pastor teacher should equip the saints for the work of the ministry so that we all continue to grow spiritually. The Bible talks about the milk of the word and the meat of the word because we are to continue to grow in our knowledge and understanding of the word of God. We're to continue to grow in love. We're to continue to grow in faith. We're to continue to grow in usefulness. We should be looking for those opportunities that God just opens the door for us to use the ministry gifts that God has given us. Because in Christ, we're not what we used to be, but we're not yet what we're going to be. We know God is still working on you and me as we grow in Christ as believers through the process of discipleship and sanctification. But let me warn you, the very moment you get satisfied in your Christian life where you're no longer hungry for the Word, and you don't thirst for righteousness, I promise you, you will drift away from the Lord. Amen. Remember, we never reach full maturity on this side of heaven. We're not going to reach full maturity until we stand in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in brand new risen glorified bodies. So let me warn you, if you're not growing spiritually in your daily walk with the Lord, then you're dying. Amen. And you've already drifted away from where you're supposed to be in your daily walk with the Lord. If you're not growing, you're dying, you're declining, you're backsliding. So thus far, we learn people fall away from the faith because they forget what's important. And we talked about several things here that should be important in the life of a believer that we should never forget. But another reason why people fall away from the faith is, number two, they overlook what is evil. They overlook what evil. That is a big problem today. Many Christians who should know better no longer see sin as the same way God sees it. That's a big problem today in God's church because God's people have tolerated sin. And that's what Jesus got on these churches about. The peer pressure from the world to tolerate ungodliness has creeped into the church. So many people today no longer call sin, sin. They got other names for it to try to make it more uh, acceptable to try to justify it. 
which we can never justify sin in God's eyes. That's why we must repent and not continue in sin, period. So right here, we're introduced to a very interesting church member at Thyatira that she should have never been allowed to come to this church, but they did. Her name was called, or she was called Jezebel. Notice verse 20. Jesus says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow, and remember, he's talking to believers. He's talking to the church at Thyatira. They were allowing things to happen that was very destructive. It was, it was not only destructive to the church, but it was destructive to people because it could cost them their souls. Because false teaching leads people away from the true gospel. So Jesus said, you folks have allowed that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, how does this woman Jezebel do this? Through false teaching. And that is a major weapon that the devil uses today to deceive a lot of people into believing lies rather than the truth. And any type of false teaching is wrong. So, notice what he said in verse 24. Now I say to you and the rest of Thyatira, as many of you do not have this doctrine. In other words, there were some that didn't listen to it. They did the right thing. And this word doctrine means teaching. So here's this woman Jezebel. Someone said, was that her actual name? I don't think it was her actual name. I think she was called a Jezebel because of the evil and the wickedness that she was known for. I don't know anybody who named their daughter Jezebel after knowing what Queen Jezebel did in the Old Testament. I mean, if you knew Jezebel in the Old Testament, I mean, for anybody that was labeled a Jezebel, that because they was mean, they was wicked, and they was immoral. That was what people thought when they thought of Jezebel. So to be called a Jezebel was not a compliment. And as I've told you before, I personally have never in all my life, man, a couple that's come to me and said, Pastor, we wanted to name our children Bible names, so here's our beautiful daughter Jezebel and our son Judas Iscariot. I've never had that happen because we know what those names mean. Well, the Bible says John the Baptist was called Elijah. We know Elijah wasn't his name, but the Bible teaches that he, he was like Elijah in his ministry. He came in the spirit of Elijah. Well, this woman here in Revelation is like a Jezebel that we learn in the Old Testament. She was a false prophetess. She called herself a prophetess. God didn't call her that. She had the spirit of Jezebel. And it's very possible today for the spirit of Jezebel to enter any church. That's why we always have to keep our guard up and never allow any false teaching to ever come into the church. That's why I promise you. Anybody ever preaches in this pulpit as a guest speaker? I promise you they've been checked out. I promise you that. I cannot in good conscience allow any guest speaker or gospel singer to get on this stage that doesn't live the life that they say they preach. It's very possible, though, to allow it to happen. We first learned about Jezebel in the first Kings. Well, I preached on it before. Remember, she was the wife of King Ahab. But she wore the pants in that palace. I guarantee you. When she told King Ahab to jump, he said, how high? She was very controlling and very manipulating. She set up idols to replace God. She sought the silence, all the true prophets of God. Her goal was to kill the true prophets of God. She wanted to, she wanted to replace the one true God with the, the, the Baal worship. That was her goal. But then the true prophet Elijah showed up on the scene. He wasn't intimidated by her seductive teaching. Elijah knew that idol worship of any kind always leads to wrong behavior. And an idol is anything that you replace God with. And the scripture says when Elijah showed up, he said, Hey folks, how long are you going to falter between two opinions? If God is God, God's the one going to answer by fire. If Baal is God, he'll answer by fire. But we know there was no response from Baal because a false God can't hear. And a false God has no power to do anything. But the one true God, Jehovah God, heard the prayer of Elijah, and he did answer by fire. And then Elijah took all those, props, those false prophets of Baal, and he took them down to the brook Kidron and had them all executed. And that shows us how to, we're supposed to treat sin in our life. We're supposed to be ruthless when it comes to cutting out sin, confessing it, repenting it, and don't look back. Well, the Jezebel of the Old Testament didn't like Elijah because of that. She hated him. She wanted him dead. And it was very clear she hated God called prophets. Well, this church at Thyatira had this woman who was called a Jezebel. She claimed to be a prophetess. This spirit of Jezebel 
She wanted to put the false teaching in the church. And I can guarantee you the spirit of Jezebel doesn't like a Bible preaching church. They don't like Bible preaching preachers. But they allowed this to happen in this church and Jesus was not happy with it. So I just want to say this in love and be very clear to you this morning so there's no misunderstanding about this. God's job description of a pastor, especially in a day in which we live today, is very clear. Listen, the Bible teaches that the pastor of a church is to be a man. I didn't write it. God did. I'm just a mailman. I'm just delivering you the letter. But I want to tell you in love, the Bible says the pastor is to be the husband of one wife, and only a man can fit that job description. I don't care what anybody says. Only a man can be the husband of one wife. There's not, there's not but two genders that God made, male and female. That's what the Bible says. Well, here was a woman who stepped into the, a place of spiritual authority in the church, called herself a prophetess with false teaching, and this church was allowing it. And evidently, she persuaded a lot of people to start following her, and they started living in sin, which displeased the Lord. And today, whenever a spirit of Jezebel enters any church, you can count on the fact, if it happens, it's because there's no strong leadership. There's no strong Bible preaching in the pulpit of a church that allows that to happen. Because I can promise you, when people are fed the Word of God week after week, when people are grounded in God's truth, they will not fall for phony baloney preachers and definitely will not put up with false teaching. But in this church, they obviously allowed her to come in and infect the church with false teaching. And it led many people astray into immoral, sinful living. Jesus said, this Jezebel seduced by people. That means she seduced his church. Many born-again Christians who should have known better have started committing sexual immorality. James tells us in his little book, in James chapter 4, verse 4, you adulterers and adulteresses. He says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Do you understand there is such a thing as spiritual adultery? Anything, I'm going to tell you, anything in your life that you love more than you love God, that's spiritual adultery. You direct your love and affection to a boat, to a car, to money, to pleasure, to hobbies, where God is no longer first and foremost. Listen, none of those things are wrong unless they take precedence over God in your life. That is spiritual adultery. We're supposed to take the love that we're supposed to give to God. It's supposed to be first and foremost. If we give it to any other person, any other place, or any other thing, that is a sin against God. So the best way to ever fight against false doctrine for coming into the church is for a preacher called by God to consistently preach true doctrine right from the pages of God's Word. The more you know the truth, the quicker you can recognize error or false teaching. And the more you have discernment to recognize sin and those things in your life that God's not pleased with so that you are motivated to confess, repent, and flee from it. So every believer really needs to be in a church where the main focus is to preach and teach the Word. That's why the pulpit is actually in the center of the stage. It's not to focus on the preacher who's doing the preaching. It's to focus on the preaching of the Word of God. That's where we're supposed to build our faith on the truth that will endure forever. So there's some words I just want to give you that's very important for you to be doctrinally sound in the truth. First word is inspiration. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture... All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means all Scripture is God-breathed. It's like God inhaled, and when He exhaled, the Word that's sharper than a two-edged sword that never returns void came out. And this book of books that we call our Holy Bible is the product of God's breath. So there's inspiration. But then there's revelation. God-inspired. And he deposited this revelation. This is the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. From Genesis to Revelation, there's no more new revelation being given today. We have all the revelation that we're going to get right in the pages of God's Word. Anybody who claims to have some new revelation that's not already in the Word of God, you don't need it and you shouldn't listen to it. Because in God's Word, we have the inspiration, and the product of inspiration is revelation. But the next word we need to think about is illumination. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in the heart of each of us as Christians. It opens our heart, 
in our minds so that we can understand inspired truth. This is a spiritual book. It requires spiritual discernment to learn and understand it. The Word of God is clear. The natural person, the lost person, the person who's never received Christ, they do not understand everything in this book, or most likely they don't understand things of the Spirit because they're spiritually discerned. But before you get saved, the Holy Spirit starts giving you that touch of illumination so that the hearing of the gospel truth draws you to the cross so you can get saved and then your eyes are opened and all of a sudden you begin to understand things you never understood before and you start growing in the Lord. You see, when a person starts getting the interest in learning about God, when a person starts thinking about getting saved, that's all evidence of the Holy Spirit working in their life. Because God makes the first call. God calls you first to be saved. No one comes to God on their own. But once a person receives the Lord as their Savior, then they receive the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Not only does He makes our body His temple, but He is our teacher who helps us understand the truth that sets us free. So we don't pray for revelation because we already got the revelation in the 66 books of the Bible. We should just pray for illumination. To be able to understand the revelation that's been given by inspiration of God. But there's another important word for you to think about when it comes to the Word of God, and that's application. The Bible is clear. We're not just to be hearers of the Word, but doers of the Word. We're supposed to put the Word into practice. God inspired His revelation. He's given us illumination to understand His inspired revelation so that we can make application. The Word of God is what shapes us more and more into the likeness of Christ. The feeding of the Word of God and growing is the best way to counteract false doctrine. It's the best way to ground us so that we resist the devil and flee temptation to fall away from the faith because that temptation will come. So some people fall away because they forget what's important. Some people fall away because they overlook what's evil and they begin to compromise and start living in sin which God can never bless. But there's a third reason why people fall away from the faith, and it's right here in the Word of God, and that is they reject what's eternal. They reject what's eternal. Now, odds are some of you probably got this question in your mind. You probably know somebody right now that you, that you love and you're concerned about and it's bothered you. Because maybe you used to see them being faithful at one time to the church and so eager to learn the Word of God, but now... They just completely deny the faith. They deny that there's a Jesus. Well, I want you to understand first, there's a big difference between rejecting the faith versus falling away from the faith. There's a big difference between a Christian who backslides and trips up a little bit and falls away from the Lord for a season, but comes back. Because a true Christian may slip. It can happen to any of us. They can backslide for a lot of number of reasons. But a true Christian cannot stay away from the Lord. They'll come back because the Holy Spirit will draw you. You can't live in peace if you're not in, 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 in the center of God's will. But what about that person that don't come back? What about that person that falls away and you never see them again? What about that person that says, I don't believe in God now. I don't believe there's a heaven. I don't believe there's a hell. I don't believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. How do you explain that? Well, the Bible does. 1 John 2.19, pretty clearly. The Bible says they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Now listen to 1 John 2, starting in verse 22. The Bible says, who is a liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. And that's pretty clear. You either know Jesus Christ personally as your Lord and Savior, that guarantees you a place in heaven, or if you don't know Jesus Christ, then you're headed for an eternal place called hell. It's either heaven or hell. And so as a believer, we need to really focus on what's eternal because false teaching dooms people to a lost eternity. Jesus talked about judgment on these people here. He talked about the consequence of them engaging and accepting this false teaching and, 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 and being involved in this gross immoral behavior. 
He goes on and talks about being dashed to pieces and like the potter's vessels. This is a clear warning about the consequences. If you don't trust Jesus Christ as your Savior before it's too late, you're going to experience the second death. Jesus said in these scriptures, he says, your works will stand against you. Amen. There's a lot of people think they're going to heaven because of the works. But the works is going to stand against them. You see, the great white throne judgment, if you're at that judgment, it's already too late for you. Because only lost people will be at the great white throne judgment. The Bible says at that judgment, the books will be open. Books, plural. That means the book of life will be open. But your name's not in it. The book of books will be there. That's the holy word of God. That's how God, that's the holy standard. And then your book of works will be there. All your works that you did apart from knowing Jesus Christ, which are useless. They're fallen works. And they'll condemn you in that moment to a Christless eternity. All because you didn't choose to be washed in the blood of Jesus and declared righteous by faith. So how do you explain then to people who fall away that say no longer believe? How do you really pray for them? Because odds are in a crowd of this size, there may be somebody, you may have a son or a daughter or some family member or maybe a close friend who may say, hey, I'm an atheist now. And they reject everything about the gospel and they don't want to hear you say anything to them about being a Christian. And you may say, but you know, I remember when they were young and they got saved and baptized. But the question is, did they really get saved? Anybody can say they're saved and still not be saved. People can think they're saved and not be saved. That's why the Bible says make sure your calling and election is sure. That's why the Bible says examine yourself to see whether or not you're in the faith. How do you, how do you know you're saved? It's not what you do. It's what Jesus has done for you. That's why we don't need to reject the eternal. We need to embrace it. Jesus said, what does it profit a person to gain the whole world but lose his soul? This world is only temporary. And everybody is heading to an eternal destination. And it's either heaven or hell depending on your choice to receive Jesus or reject Jesus. And there are not many ways to heaven, regardless of why Hollywood and all the religions will tell you there's not many ways to heaven. There's only one way. And all those folks that choose the broad ways of this world and the broad ways of religion are going to find out the hard way. They have been deceived, but then it's going to be too late. Beware of the spirit of Jezebel who tells you about all these other ways or about some new way or some new revelation that's been revealed that Bible preachers won't tell you about. Let me tell you, if somebody ever comes to you and says something, they got something new and it's not in the Word of God, you run away from that like a scared rabbit because there is nothing new under the sun. Everything God has got to say to us is right here in this blessed book. And there's more in this book than I could ever live up to in my lifetime. This word is complete. God's word is eternal. His word will endure forever. And I don't need any other teaching or some claim to some new revelation. God has already given us the complete word of revelation right here in this book. So keep your nose in this book. Let this book be part of your regular diet so that you're never led astray by false teaching. Notice what Jesus said in verse 25. Be, but hold fast what you have till I come. You hang on to this truth. There's warfare involved. We fight the devil, the world, the flesh every single day. But we got truth we can always hold on to. Plus we have a promise. A promise from Jesus himself that we can hold fast to. Jesus said, I am coming. He didn't say I might be coming. He said, I am coming. I'm coming. Listen, ladies and gentlemen. We only have one life to live on this earth. And so you want to live it for the temporary that's passing when you can choose to live for the eternal? Why not live it for Jesus? Why not live it for laying up treasures in heaven? Why not live for looking for the coming king who is coming? Jesus said, he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I'll give power over the nations. This is speaking about reigning with Christ when he comes back to set up his millennial reign in majesty and glory. You see, the overcomer is a true born-again believer, a person who's truly been born of God. They're loving, they're serving, they're growing, and they're being steadfast. That is clear fruit evidence that you will persevere in the faith. You'll stick with it. You're in it for the long haul. The good times, the bad times, you will be faithful until the end. 
Does it mean you'll be perfect? No, but you'll be faithful. But what about the person who's not? How about the person that falls away completely? The person who never comes back. The person who says, I just don't believe anymore. That is because they never had it to begin with. Regardless of what they say. They may have had a profession of faith. They may have even confessed it with their lips. But they never possessed it in their heart. They had information in their head. But they never really did have a regenerated heart. They were born physically. But they were never born again spiritually. They may have had their name on a church roll somewhere. But their name was not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. For a while they did the best they could. And in their own ability, in their own flesh, they eventually ran out of juice. And they flaked out. And they fall off by the wayside. Only those who really know Jesus Christ as a Savior will keep on keeping on and persevere to the end. That's why you need to look in your heart this morning. You need to ask yourself, does Jesus Christ really dwell in my heart? Because odds are in a crowd of this size a day, maybe someone who may watch this one day online. Listen, we're all overwhelmed anymore by the bad news that's constantly around us. Day after day, night after night on the news, all the senseless killings we're seeing. Crime rate out of control in places that used to have never seen any crime. It's going all across our nation. It's, it's heart-wrenching. And just about when you think it can't get any worse, it does. But listen to what Jesus told the church at Thyatira. And he's telling you and me this today. Don't give up. Be steadfast. Stand up for the Lord at all costs because here's the good news. And this promises to you, child of God. Jesus says, I will give to him, this is the true Christian, the morning star. Now we know the morning star is that star that suddenly appears just right at the dawn of the day. But this morning star in the scripture is talking about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that's a promise because one of these days, you may get up and say, you know, I can't read the newspaper anymore. I'm not going to look at the news online I can't watch that television anymore. It just seems like things are getting worse and worse. But suddenly, when it, all, when it seems like all hope is lost, one of these days in the future, which I believe will be soon, don't know the day nor the hour, but I believe it's close, Jesus is going to rise off that throne. He will descend from the heavens with a shout. And I want you to know, my friends, there's coming today the Lord Jesus Christ is going to reach out his nail-scarred hands and he's going to take up all of his children in his arms and wing us to glory and we'll be with him forever and ever. Listen, child of God, lift up your head. Your redemption is drawing near. The bride and morning star is getting ready to appear. Jesus Christ is coming again. And until he comes, Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And the Holy Spirit speaking right now. And he's telling some of you today, you need to get saved. You need to get your life right with Jesus Christ today before it's too late. He may be telling some of you, you need to get baptized. You've accepted me. Now follow through with it. Identify with me in the waters of baptism. He may be saying some of you, you need to get your life back right with God. Yes, you've been saved. You've been baptized. But you drifted. You have forgot what some of your priorities are. And Jesus said, today, get your focus and priorities back where it needs to be. And some of you, he may be telling you, you may want to join this church. You want to be in a church that preaches and teaches the Word of God. Jesus is telling all of us, hold fast what you have until I come. Jesus is coming soon. The question is, when he comes, will you be caught up? To meet him in the air? Or will you be left behind? Because you knew about him, but you just didn't know him as Savior and Lord. Don't let that happen to you. Jesus gives the warning today so that you're not caught off guard and that you're not left behind. Today is the day of salvation. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Oh, Holy Spirit, take this time now of invitation. Lord, I pray, Lord, we'll always do our part to keep our guard up and never allow a spirit of Jezebel to ever enter this property. Lord, may we always be grounded in your truth. Recognize false teaching immediately, but stand against it. We want to be found faithful when you come. 
I pray for anyone right now that needs to make a decision, eternal decision, life-changing decision right now. Have your way right now as we sing our hymn of invitation. In Jesus' holy name, amen.